we are down to the wire. Stephen Hart and Michael Muir, both Western Australians. Hart on the line, a left-hander from uh, from Perth in Western Australia, 24 years old, been bowling a number of years, and these bowlers are bowling for a big pile of money and a whole lot of other stuff. And that's a way to start. He did that pretty easy, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, well, throughout the whole tournament, Steve has the high game of the tournament. Uh, 299. He actually bowled that when, with me in qualifying. He left a, a solid ringing seven. He's bowled great all week. Uh, led it by some 200 odd pins. He really dominated the event. But uh, as we've seen before in, in the previous ladies match, anything can happen. It's all up to Michael Muir. But uh, interesting to note that Yeti's from Western Australia. The two men are from Western Australia. Maybe they're not so far away. Maybe, yes, is there something there? And uh, uh, recently, of course, we had the Asian Zone FIQ Championships, which is the world controlling body of the sport, had their Asian Championships held every two years, 18 countries in Perth. Recently, some great scores out of there on some pretty tough conditions. So uh, no wonder the Western Australians rise to the occasion when the conditions get a little hard. Well, that was a good spare, Steve. <laughs> yes, it was great. It was a great event over there. Obviously, they've uh, come over here pumped up. They've seen the best in Asia over there playing, and uh, they've said, let's go over and take the money. They've both bowled well. Michael Muir's bowling very well. He's changed balls from the previous match. He used the Rhino Pro before, uh, but uh, he's just going to go out there. He's got a spare to start. Steve Hart with a strike. He, again, he's the underdog. He has to go out there and do it all. And a great shot. Well, Michael Muir is 27 years old. He's a courier from Western Australia, commenced bowling in 1983. His current average in uh, tournament play throughout the West is 202. He has a high game of 290, which is 10 off the perfect score. And uh, this week uh, in play, of course, he didn't even look in contention to make the finals last night, but had a spectacular nine games of match play this morning here at Belcon and Bowen Canberra where he averaged well into the 220s 226 I think was his average for nine games found himself in this final and he's up against uh, Stephen Hart the left-hander from Perth who opens with a strike and almost a double with a bit of luck almost a double with a lot of luck I thought that wasn't a very good shot put it down a bit short the ball runs up you see here Steve going through his shot just gets down a little bit short didn't get down long enough hand rolls over the top a little unlucky, could have taken it out, got a double, but just got to go up, get a spare. Michael Muir started with a spare strike. Steve's got a strike spare. If you can pick this up. And not a problem. Steve Hart, of course, is... Uh, Steve Hart's no stranger to, uh, to national bowling and indeed finals of... Uh, of tournaments as we look at an interesting uh, shot of the left-hander Stephen Hart with uh, that spare on the, on the 10 pin and easy conversion. Hart commenced bowling in 1985 and in only three years after he started in 1988 he won the South Australia Cup in January of that year and picked up his first major national tournament and in fact a, a, a rocket start to the top of 10 pin bowling for Stephen Hart and he could well go on and take the, uh, the prize of all prizes here in Australian bowling each year, the South Pacific Classic, which of course goes goes with uh, a uh, first place check of four and a half thousand dollars. The runner up in this match will receive three thousand dollars. Graham Smith, of course, who was defeated by Michael Muir earlier today in the uh, preliminary final, took uh, two and a half thousand dollars for her, his third place. But uh, Stephen Hart now concentrating on uh, converting the spare. Should be an easy one for him. A good spare. Steve Hart's an excellent player. He's just got such a good approach. He, he's just through the line. He's got a nice even speed, nice even tempo. He just strokes through the ball and lets the ball run up. As I said, his 299 game was a great game. Unlucky to shoot 300. And I noticed in his profile he's bowled 299 twice now. So he's a great player. But it's all up to Michael Muir. He's got a strike up. He needs to get a double to put some pressure straight on. Uh, on Steve. Terry, it's interesting. He had trouble with his equipment in the uh, preliminary final round, or the first match he appeared in, wiping his thumb there and obviously uh, released that ball badly. Uh, what, could he have uh, thumb problems or is it a bit of nerves, the lights? We'll see this release. He clearly drops it. He loses the release uh, off the thumb. I'd say it's more tension than anything else. It's tension related. He's like he's used the ball to average 220 odd today to come into the final. Uh, the ball's probably not the problem, but the lights, it was very hot and very sweaty underneath the lights. And uh, a lot of tension to go with it. The palms start to sweat. 
and it's just a matter of he's just got to settle himself down and get some confidence to get rid of the tension. He you know, just has to get control of himself and do a good job and keep some pressure on Stewie, but he has to pressure Stewie. As, we, as in the previous match with Cara and Yeti, Michael's the underdog. He has to come up. Everyone expects Steve to win. He ha Michael has to win twice. She's just got to go out and do the job. But not with shots like that. He's, uh, he's definitely not releasing the ball as well as he did in the match play segment. I thought the first match he was a little fortunate to, uh, to win with Graham opening the tenth. But you know, Michael Hughes has gone spare strike, spare. He's got eight, 58 in the third. Steve strikes. It's, the match is all tied up. Well, uh, Michael Muir's certainly got some credentials. He's represented his state of Western Australia uh, on seven occasions. Certainly great credit. And this year, he's the captain of the Western Australian men's team that will play shortly in the uh, Walter Rockway Trophy Tournament, which is the interstate teams event held in conjunction with the Australian Nationals each year. As we look at Muir's form for that uh, conversion of the eight spare in the fourth frame, his total 58 in the third with that spare working in the fourth. And if Stephen Hart strikes here, as Terry suggested, the match is all tied up in the third frame. Michael, they're watching what's going on. I don't think that's such a good idea, but let's see what Steve's going to do. He needs to get up, get a strike, put some pressure on. And he crosses over to his opposite pocket, the left hander's Brooklyn pocket, as it's called. The, the traditional one two pocket is the way the, uh, the ball should hit the pins, but it doesn't. It crosses over, but uh, the nine count, not too bad, and an easy eight pin conversion, taking the score to 57 in the third for Hart, 58 for Muir, Hart down by a pin. As I said, Steve, with the lane conditions the way they are, the way to play these sort of shots is throw the ball out of the gutter and watch it come back. You know, these guys have obviously played together quite often, so they both know each other's games fairly well. Actually, it would, would probably help both of them, in fact, because, uh, because of playing together so often. Here they are out there, and I'm playing on TV probably for the first time. It's, uh, it's very difficult, and also playing uh, to represent Australia in the World Cup, big check involved, trip to Paris, France. Let's see what Steve can do. He needs to get some good shots going. And that's exactly what he didn't want, although at this early stage of the match, it's certainly not the disaster. It could be later on. But uh, he has, of course, if he, if he loses, and we look at his form from this uh, unique camera angle. Terry looks great there, but uh, certainly not the shot he wants, it. he wants at this stage in the match. But, uh, of course, he has that safety valve, knowing Stephen Hart is top qualifier, that if he, in fact, gets beaten by Michael Muir, he has the right to rechallenge one game sudden death to see who takes out the 1992 South Pacific Classic. And a great spare. That's a great spare. Just clips the, head, just clips the seven pin and the head pin goes around. That's how he wants to pick it up. That'll give him a bit of confidence. But it's all up to Michael. He's got up now. He's like, if he strikes, he can be five, fin, five pins up. You see here, Steve yeah, putting the pin out, hits the kick back, top of the pin comes out and clips the top of the seven pin. Michael just needs to get something going. If he can get something going early, it's going to open the match up a little for him. Looks good, Terry. That Eight. was. Great shot. It's a little more aggression from Michael Muir. And uh, an aggressive player he is. Uh, he was runner-up in the WA Gold Nugget tournament uh, early this year. He won the Kelmscott Classic earlier this year also. So he's had a good 92. And he was third in the New South Wales Open, one of the top events on the East Coast each year. Uh, so Michael Muir has great form, averaging 202 currently in tournaments throughout Western Australia. And as we suggested earlier, has a high game of 290. And uh, his form in this tournament, he averaged 206 for the 43 games of the men's division of the South Pacific. And that's exactly what he wanted. Came out, two good shots. I think when he left that, when he missed the head pin there and he went for the spare, I noticed that his spare shot was exactly where he wanted his strike shot to be. So maybe he made an adjustment with his feet and uh, used it as a bit of practice. That's a, that makes good sense, a good thing to do when you're in a, a match like this. And he's come back out and uh, come up with a double. As it stands now, Michael can be like, with another strike, will be 108 in the fifth. Steve strikes here, will be 93. It's like a 15 pin deficit, but Steve's got two shots. He can get up, get a double, and he can get 10 back. Looks good, and a great. great result. He liked it, took off after it. That was a great result. That's exactly what he wants. 
Terry, we've seen two left-handers in the grand finals here, Stephen Hart from Western Australia and Cara Honeychurch, of course, in the women's grand final. And although defeated by Yeti Jacobs, certainly was the dominant force, at least through qualifying and match play. Why have the left-handers seemed to come to the fore here in Canberra this week? Well, you know, we recently had a tournament. Left-handers finished three out of the top four. Uh, in this centre this week, left hand, but both left handers have been dominant. It's purely because, not that there's a left handed shot there, but purely because the right hand side, there's so many more right handed bowlers bowling than there are left handers. Uh, plus the lane condition, as I said, it's a high line in centre. And uh, it, it's purely just worn more on the right hand side than the left hand side. The lane conditions are exactly the same on both sides, it's just that the left side's a little bit better, so it's a lot less used. Uh, you like got 90% right handers and 10% left, so. It's, um, that's merely the reason. There's no real other advantage other than merely wear and tear. It just happens. There's some centres that are going to favour left-handers and some that, uh, some that isn't. But uh, that's really what bowling's all about. You know, if the same people were dominant all the time, then, they, then you know, hey, left-handers wouldn't play, and that's really not a fair game, is it? You know, like, it's horses for courses. But as it stands now, it puts Michael, let's put Steve Hart, sorry, 113 in the sixth. Michael Muir, if he gets up, puts uh, another strike in. He can be like 108 in the fifth with a double up, so he can extend his lead with one ball. And he's already in front. So let's, it's all up to Michael at this stage. But it would be interesting if, if Michael does get up and win, that both left-handers being dominant throughout the event get up and lose in the final. Well, that uh, three strikes in a row wasn't to be. Again, uh, concentrating on his hand and the perspiration. See Michael Muir's form here at the line. Again, a little uh, bad release from him. I'm sure he's not happy with that part of his game at the moment. And uh, an easy conversion under normal conditions for a bowler of uh, Michael Muir's talent. Let's just see what he can do to take this uh, fairly simple spare. He does so, although they always worry me when they make that shot from the left-hand side of the approach. Uh, really traditionally. Steve, I that. uh, <laughs> yeah, Terry, that's why I'm worried. And perhaps that's why you're here. It probably is, but uh, I think you're a brave man saying it's an easy spare. I don't think any spare out there is easy. Well, certainly especially under these conditions, that's right. Especially buckets and combination spares. Uh, I've seen too many missed in this situation. Just an open frame. And the situation now is Michael Muir's 12 pins in front. Going into the 7th or going into the 8th. He wants to get a strike up and sit down with 10 up. Let's see what he can do. Oh, great shot. Great shot. He's in good form, Muir. And although he has to do this uh, the hard way, if indeed he wants to represent Australia later this year in the AMF Bowling World Cup in Le Mans, France, and take that $4,500 first place check, he uh, certainly has his eyes set on that prize. But uh, Stephen Hart, a young man who's won a major national title, certainly some years ago, in 1988, he won the South Australian Cup, as we said earlier, represented Australia... Uh, the Australian youth team in the Philippines in Manila in that same year then had a little time off uh, from the sport and certainly making his presence felt back in the game at this level this week in Canberra and that's why Terry that was a great shot you know Steve there doing exactly what he needed to do he's got to get up now and get a double to get to uh, get back into the match but uh Let's see what he does. He really is a stylist, isn't he, Terry? Stephen Hart. He has that traditional solid left-handers game. Very, very much a stylist. He is very much so. Uh, Steve's got, I think this Steve's got a great game. Uh, he just maybe needs, needs to get a bit more leverage at the line, a little bit more lift on it, throw a bit more ball. Uh, he's out there using the new, uh, new age ball with the tacky surface that uh, really does grip the lane. That's the double he requires. Being 12 down, the double there is going to uh, going to pick him up. But again, just do the replay. Carries all the pins, get the good swishing strike, which I was saying before. A lot of the men now play for the swishing strike, uh, and uh, and that's the way they like to see the pins over. But Michael Muir has got got a strike up, and he now gets to uh, to finish the match out. If he can strike out, he shuts him out. So it's again all up to Michael. Let's see if he can get a strike here. This one he needs though. If he can get this, it'll real good. And he does. And he does. It was a great shot. So both bowlers finding their way into the pocket. The left and the right hand is striking here at the closing stages of this very important match. Of course, if Stephen Hart is defeated in this game, he does have the right to re-challenge and it'll go to one more sudden death game. Michael Muir, 145 in the seventh frame, but has a double working in frames eight and nine. 
and he's now on the approach to make his closing frame, the tenth and final frame. And uh, certainly the door is open for him to push this event into one more game. Well, if Michael strikes here, he can, uh, if he gets strike on a nine spare, he'll shut, uh, shut Steve out. He needs a strike here. And leaves just the three pin. The ball crossing a little off the, uh, to the left of the head pin. 174 in the eighth frame with that strike in the ninth and this spare to make 194 in the ninth. A replay of Muir's form with that three pin remaining. That's right, Steve. Yeah, Michael Muir can go spare strike for uh, 214. But uh, Steve Hart has to now strike, strike at least all the way. Because of the, because of the low count, Steve can strike out for a possible 223, so he has to strike out all the way. Because well, of the low counts that uh, during the match, Michael needs to strike here. If he can strike here, that'll mean that uh, Steve will have to go all the way. Otherwise, if he goes, if he go, gets one more and then gets a nine, we are into a re-challenge. Yeah, he can shoot 212, which is two pins short, so he has to go. He can punch out for a possible 223, but Michael needs to strike here. If he gets a low count, he can open the door a little for Sturt. Okay, the nine taking his total to 203. Taking his total to uh, 213, excuse me, and uh, we'll just see what happens here. This is the replay of the final ball of the 10 pin, solid 10 pin, the 213 game to Michael Muir. And Stephen Hart with two strikes working, a strike in the eighth and a strike in the ninth, has his destiny in, the, uh, in his own hands, Terry. If he uh, strikes here... Well, uh, he has to get two strikes. Two strikes, stri gets a double in the tenth, taking them one at a time. He's on his way to Le Mans, France for the AMF World Cup. Let's just see what this young man from Perth can do. Didn't give it much of a chance at all. No, he didn't again. As I've said, that the, uh, the lane conditions during the week have been such that the left hand has had a bit of an area. The right hand has had an area as well. He, he sent it out a little bit wide there, but we've re-oiled before the TV show today and with the television lights, the lane conditions change a little bit. It's a little bit different. And uh, one thing that is going to help the, the, uh, the second place get here, or the challenger, although Steve has two matches, um, the format that we've used today Michael Muir comes in, he just hits the ball two matches straight against Steve. On other stepladder occasions, it's, it's a progression where they just keep, continually keep winning and it's hard to win three or four matches in a row. But Michael's had a bit of a rest. He gets now just to come out and uh, play Steve and, and play two games. So it's a little easier, I think, for the challenge of this, on this way. Like I know last year I had to come out and beat Rob Zickman and then turn it around straight away and then play Jason. And, and this week we've alternated between the uh, ladies and the men's. And I think that's a bit of an advantage for second place. Well, there's a finish. One straight through the nose for the big four. But fortunately, it uh, doesn't have to go back and get it. It's effectively meaningless. A 196 total to Stephen Hart. Michael Muir's 213 game means we're into a sudden death challenge. One game here to decide the winner of the 1992 AMF Coca-Cola South Pacific Classic at Bell Conan Bowl in Canberra. And of course, we'll wait to see that result. Terry, we're down to the final game now in the AMF Coca-Cola South Pacific Classic for 1992. Stephen Hart, top qualifier, has the right to re-challenge. Michael Muir, he's obviously elected to do that. It goes without saying. And uh, he gets off to uh, not quite the start he wanted, but a, a nine count. Well, Steve, as we've seen, the left-handers have been dominant all week. They've led the tournament really, very convincingly. Um, Cara struggled to get the ball up to the head pin. When she did, she couldn't get the carry. Steve's having a similar problem. So obviously the left side's changed a little here on the TV pair for the telecast again. You can't overemphasize the fact that there is a lot of, a lot of heat out there, a lot of lights. Uh, it's a totally different situation than bowling the match play. And it's uh, maybe a bit of an advantage for the right-handers at the moment, but that's not to be the, you know, like I noticed at the end of the last match between uh, Steve and Michael, the camaraderie between the two of them. As I said before, they've played each other a lot and, and uh, it's just going to be one heck of a match and whoever goes, goes and I, I think both are going to be great ambassadors for Australia. No question at all. Both will do a great job, whoever wins this tournament and uh, flies off later this year to, uh, to France. And there's a lazy seven pin, not quite wanting to fall, but uh, the full count for Michael Muir and his opening frame. And uh, he's got good form, he's a solid player, of course, uh, a man who didn't even look like he should make this final last night. And we're down.
down to the wire with this one game and an eight count in the second frame for Michael Muir. Yes, yeah, so at this stage we'll see here Steve's ball again, not getting up to the head pin. Just lose the 2-5. Again, a fairly difficult spare. Probably go for it from the left-hand side of the lane, but... He probably will too, <laughs> no question at all. But actually, as Steve's right, that's quite dangerous with this condition. Again, you've got more on the centre of the lane, less on the left. You drive it short, it runs away. Throw it too far to the right, and uh, it doesn't come back. Let's see what it does with the spare. Converts that easily enough. Michael Muir, of course, is a courier, 27-year-old courier from Perth. He commenced bowling in 1983 at 202 average, currently in tournaments throughout Australia. And mostly of those events have uh, been highlighted in the West. Uh, his home state has a high game of 290 and has represented his state on a number of occasions in uh, interstate teams competition. And will do so this year again, but as captain of the men's team to compete in a couple of weeks at Gosford in the Walter Rockway Interstate Teams Tournament, well, the highlight of the team's uh, events around Australia each year. Stephen Hart, not what he wanted, Terry, a spare in the first frame, but that split menacing in the second. Well, at this stage, it's, uh, you know, Cara put up a valiant, valiant fight in, the, uh, in her second match, but Steve early in the match is open. Um, you know, I think Michael fortunate in his win over Graham Smith, but... Uh, Steve's got to find something real quick because this is it now. There's, you no longer have that luxury of being able to lose. Uh, that's all there is to it. And it's a little bit of a letdown because you've dominated the tournament all throughout. You come out, you come out, you bowl like two games on television and you don't really uh, get comfortable at all. And, and it's very, very difficult to try and get yourself together and, and make good shots and, and keep your confidence up. You know, Michael's got a win under his sleeve. You know, in his recent win, he averaged 238, so he's a pretty dangerous player. Oh. And that's more of the form we know of Stephen Hart. And uh, he certainly has, uh, has dictated the terms in the latter part of the AMS South Pacific Classic here in Canberra. Uh, Sam Romeo from New South Wales was the early leader in qualifying and indeed in the first segment and second segment of the match play. But uh, Sam not doing too well today, dropping down and finishing in fifth place. Fourth in this tournament was Carl Bottomley Bottom from Queensland. Graham Smith, of course, finishing in third place and taking that third place check of two and a half thousand. And we're now into this final match. Michael Muir, and very unlucky indeed uh, on both occasions. Unlucky to get that split result out of a high pocket hit. But... Well, again, this is the problem with this. You'll see the ball goes high, just cuts straight through. As we saw with Cara Honeychurch's ball, it just cut, cut straight through. You've probably got the lanes have been re before the telecast. You've got a little bit of carry down now. The ball doesn't roll as much in the back end as it has been doing all day. You've got to make slight adjustments to your game. Ooh, even unlucky to get it, as we saw before with, uh, with Eddie Jacobs. And uh, you, can, you can pick up spares out of the back. You see here the ball go down, hits the back pit, bounces right out of the back pit and almost takes out the nine pin, which have given, it, have given him the spare he required. But as it stands now, he's opened the third frame. Sort of lets Steve off. You know, Steve made a mistake and opened the second frame. Michael's now 47 in the third. That wasn't a very good shot either. As, uh, he, you know, he sort of maybe overcompensated a little bit, but one thing that is, uh, you know, as I said, with the lane conditions, the lanes are playing a little tighter. And you really have to throw the ball a little bit differently to get a good reaction. Perfect. And makes it. I think it's interesting to note, Terry, that both players have a bit of a different attitude, noticeably, to what the first match was. Uh, early in the first match, friendly, smile, uh, the high fives for the strikes and so on. Uh, both players knowing each other very well, of course, both being top players in Western Australia. But now I notice um, the seriousness start to take over. I think they both realise, and indeed they would have done early in the piece, but now more importantly they've realised exactly what's at stake in this match. Definitely. I'll never forget watching the, um, the American Skins Golf Tournament, like the first hole always turns out to be a bit of a party for all four players. And then after the pot builds up after two or three holes, they get real serious. And, uh and the jokes stop. Yes, well, the jokes appear to have stopped here, and certainly these gentlemen not joking at all, but it's quite interesting to note and feel this uh, sense of tension. tension and the seriousness now, uh, early in the piece, nice and light. Now they're down to it, and uh, they're both 
serious players trying to win the biggest tournament that they're ever likely to win in this country, the South Pacific Classic, in its 28th year here, and a lot at stake. That was a great spare. It's exactly what Steve wants. You know, it puts him now like Steve's only two pins down, courtesy of Michael's open. If Steve can get up now and get a strike, it means he'll go back sitting down with a strike. Michael's got to get up to do something. If he doesn't strike, the match will probably end up even, or uh, if Michael gets a low count, he can go behind. But you're right, Steve, you can feel the tension now. You can see it in both players. They're, you know, that one of them needs to become aggressive. Um, this is the thing that I think is lacking out there at the moment. Is they, one of them needs to get aggressive. He has to go after it. Can't wait for the other person to give it to you. And with a little bit of a push, that 10-pin move, Stephen Hart might have just got that thing, that aggression started. Exactly, and that little bit of luck to maybe, maybe uh, kickstart him a little. You'll see here on the replay, the pins come off the deck, that pin turns around, doesn't quite hit it hard enough, and it just doesn't fall over. But uh, Steve shouldn't have any problem with the spare. But it's up to one of them. They've really got to start hitting the pocket and start crashing the pocket and uh, try and intimidate the other player and, uh, and beat him mentally. Hart here for the 10-pin conversion which he makes in the uh, fourth frame. Uh, fifth frame for Hart, 64 in the fourth with that spare. Michael Muir, 47 in the third frame. But with a spare in the fourth, and now uh, hopefully working for his sake onto a strike in the fifth frame. And, of course, his reputation for uh, power play is, uh, is one that comes before him. He's represented his state on a number of occasions. He's a, a great player. Immense concentration from Muir as he looks to yes. take 10 and does so. That's exactly what he needs to do. He needs to get out there and be aggressive, go pounding the pocket, get it right in there, and uh, put good, positive shots in. That's the thing. Like, if you've got a player you're playing against and he's tentative and you can come out and become real positive, you can jump all over him and, uh, and make a good match of it. But Michael, by way of the strike, has increased his lead now to three pins with a strike working. If he gets a double, Steve Hart sitting down, just lost 10 pins. Again, he needs to, if he, he really if he needs a shot, this is it because he's running out of frames. We're halfway through the game. Needs to get a double now. And also close. And fell at the last minute. It's gone. Just before the machine touched it, the uh, ten pin fell very late, giving Michael Muir exactly what he was after, a double. And uh, we'll Let see this uh, replay. See there, something just clipped the 10 pin and it's just fallen forward. Unbelievable. Probably the 6 pin there just wrapped around it, just tipped the bottom of it. I bet you was pleased to see that go. You'll see a big sigh of relief there. And, big uh, sigh. That gives him a double. Gives him another 10 pins here. up. Steve's got to start striking or else uh, he's just going to run out of time. He's got to get aggressive with it. Yes. And does. Taking his total to 84 with that strike. 84 in the uh, fifth frame for Steve Hart with that strike working. Of course, must double as well if he wants to stay close. And perfect form at the line, Stephen Hart. A great release and the perfect result, Terry. Does exactly what he needs. But he needs to start hitting the pocket, you know, like he can get a lucky break now and, and it might pump him up even more. But good, solid shots. Um, they really are the tonic to going on to winning a tournament because if you can go out there and get solid shots, it gives you the confidence. Plus, it rattles your opponent because he sits there and says, Jesus, guys, looking, looking real good, and I'm a bit shaky. So let's see what he does with this one. And he's fouled. Unbelievable. He has fouled. I have can't recall seeing that in a national final of a tournament since 1982 when Steve Neff from the United States fouled in the final of the Melbourne Cup at Ringwood Lanes and cost him the title over Ron Powell. And of course, and way to the left and shattered his confidence. And well, Michael Muir is just sitting there shaking his, his head saying like, Steve Hart struck on the shot. It would have given him the double that he needed. It would have really made the match all up. Uh, like, would have squared up the match. But, you know, Michael, you know, his teammate, and I'm sure he's bowled with him in, in Rockway before, and just shaking his saying, oh, hey, I don't want to win this way. But so that's an unbelievable error from Steve. You can, you can see him there. He was obviously shattered by it. But really, it was after a strike. And I don't think he should have sat down, maybe, and, and got his composure a little bit and, and thought, well, you know, like a, it's a bad blunder. But... 
I can remember myself, I bought a television match, I threw a gutter ball and still got up and won with the 2.30 game. So. And Jason Dowse, of course, last year in this, exactly. in this tournament, did the very same thing exactly. and won. Exactly. Well, Mew has taken, at least tried to take advantage of yeah. that, uh, well, I don't know whether you call it a mistake. Do you say how sorry you feel for him? I mean, how many times would Stephen Hart have fouled, crossed the line, the black line at the uh, that separates the approach area and the start of the lane? And, of course, uh, if you foul, you get no pins for that ball. So, effectively, his total for the seventh frame was a total of six pins, taking Stephen Hart's score to 106 trailing now a long way from Michael Muir who struck in the seventh now working on the spare in the eighth. Well if he spares here it's like 30, 30 pin deficits. He's just like gone from, from being three pins behind to 30 pins behind. Uh, that, that is unbelievable. You know you'll see here with Michael Muir just going through uh, the motions of picking up the 10 pin. It's right through the ball and a very important thing with the 10 pin the ball goes out, comes back, picks it up. As you said, uh, Steve, in last year's match, Jason Dowse did just about everything wrong. He split, he opened frames, he threw gutter balls, but he, he was, because he's a big power player, he came out through the strikes when he needed it. That's exactly what Michael Muir should have done. When he fouled, he should have come back, recomposed himself. I think it got to him too much. And, uh, you know, I think even maybe Michael even feels a little sorry for him at this stage, but, but that's the game. You know, this is, this is sport, and that's what it's all about. But uh, that's unbelievable. I don't think anybody fouled in the entire South Pacific. And uh, you've got like 80 players playing. Yes, well, we had a total, a total in of fact, of 176 for the field all up. You said 90 men, 54 women, and then mm. 36 juniors from five countries. And I would think, as Terry has just said, nobody would have fouled during the entire event. It's just such a basic error. He's 106 now in the seventh frame, 133 to Michael Muir with that spare now, 143 in the eighth, plus his bonus uh, from his ninth shot. Muir leads by 27 pins over Steve Hart in the seventh frame. Well, if Steve Hart can get himself back together again and uh, punch out... Well, he's certainly not out of it, but no I'm way. sure he's shattered completely. Such a basic error. Well, it just happens. As I said, uh, you know, when I threw a gutter ball on TV, I, I just lost my timing completely and just put it down on my foot. But let's see if he can come back. Let's see what sort of a, see if we can get some, something going. Well, I think he made a good shot. Made a good shot. I think he was a little unlucky there. He could have certainly tripped the six and uh, and got the strike. But he just needs to uh, get himself together. We'll see here. See there. See how he just finishes close to the line all the time. So for him to foul, he's like only got to be out two inches, which is which is not a heck of a lot. But it was just a lunge at the line. Slight error in judgment, bit of tension, bit of nerves. Just got to go out there, make the shots. Okay, well, Hart converts that single pin spare easily, and uh, both uh, players have completed their eighth frame. Hart selecting to finish last, so he will now f finish his ninth frame, but sit out while Michael Muir plays the ninth and tenth frame. And uh, a bit of self talk there from Michael Muir. Uh, bit of concentration thinking what he has to do this is the biggest moment in his bowling career uh, going into the ninth and tenth frame makes solid shots and he can take this and be off to Le Mans France to represent Australia in the World Cup but it's not over perhaps for Steve Hart and a big strike there well not by any means Steve if Steve Hart can get up here and uh, strike out he can shoot a 186 game if Michael makes a mistake Steve's going to jump all over him so uh, despite the foul and decide, like what a disaster, but uh, despite that, he can still win the match. It's still up, we've seen it before, where players have been 20 pins up with two frames to go and end up losing by 10. So Absolutely. anything yes. can happen. Michael's got to make good shots. He's got to uh, keep the ball around the pocket, I feel, and, and, and close everything. Just can't make any mistakes. And a good great shot. shot. Great Couldn't shot. have done any better than that except for the carry, Terry. It, it exactly, that's a great shot. Nothing. He's just got to go back now. 10 pin at this stage. Shouldn't put, pose a problem to him. He was solid on it before. You see Michael's form here. He's just a basic, basic release. Just comes through the ball. A little bit of a forward roll with a tilted wrist. At this stage, if he spares and strikes spares, if he sort of marks out, he shoots 192. And if Steve strikes out, he can shoot 186. So if Michael makes any errors, Steve can still jump all over him just like Jason did last year. Absolutely, and he's made that spare in the ninth frame. 152 in the eighth with the spare that he's just uh, just working now in the ninth. 162 plus the bonus ball. 
possible 202 game. And uh, we already are aware that Hart can only make 186. So Muir now needs a count. Strike would be great for him. A spare is all he needs to stay. Uh, to start learning to talk French. Absolutely. See what Muir can do under pressure. The, this is the most important shot of his career. And does he make it work for him? That was fantastic. That was a, such a great shot. By doing that, he now shuts uh, Steve Hart out. Steve has no chance of winning. And uh, well, right now, even his second shot of six. This shot took Michael Muir to the AMF Bowling World Cup in France. And what a great shot it was. What a fantastic performance by this young man who looked absolutely out of any contention last night. He's averaged 226 in nine games of match play today to make this final. Just beat Graham Smith in the preliminary match. Beat Stephen Hart and beats him twice. That's right, and also Steve, like his first match up in the match play this morning, he, he lost with the 279 game. So he has, he sort of, uh, probably when he started out with 279 and lost to, to Graham Smith's 280 game in the match play, he probably thought, well, this isn't going to be my day. Well, uh, I think he was wrong. He was absolutely wrong, and a big sigh. He's just realised what he's done. Uh, a smile, yes, it is a smile too, and why shouldn't he be happy? Michael Muir, the captain of the Western Australian men's team, is on his way to France to represent Australia in the AMF Bowling World Cup, and with it, he'll take four and a half thousand dollars. His total 192, uh, certainly below his average for this tournament. Muir averaged 206 for the 43 games, and is he a happy fella? And why shouldn't he be? Oh, he certainly is. I don't think he can stop smiling. I think uh, he's just sitting there going, "What the heck has happened here?" You know, probably last night he was uh, thinking, "Well, you know, let's go home again and come back next year." And well, he definitely is going to be coming back next year now. As we look for the titles from Stephen Hart, and of course, uh, who will know uh, what would have happened to this match if Hart hadn't have fouled on his first ball in the seventh frame, and then, of course, uh, shattered, I guess, by that. Uh, was only able to muster a six pin count which dropped him way off the pace and uh, Muir of course picking up on that opportunity a 192 game and uh, this seven count for Hart and an easy spare he has a possible 166 game depending on this count but it's all over as far as uh, the Western Australian boys are concerned Stephen Hart will have to settle for second place and three thousand dollar check Graham Smith of course in third for a two and a half thousand dollar check but the big winner today not only 10 pin bowling but 10 pin bowling in Western Australia with Yeti Jacobs and now Michael Muir just a happy man off <laughs> to Le Mans France later this year to represent Australia in the AMF Bowling World Cup, singularly the most important amateur bowling event in the world. Stephen Hart's total of 163, and both fellow Western Australians congratulate each other on what a fantastic result we have here for bowling in Western Australia, and indeed what great bowling we've seen for the junior division of the South Pacific Classic Boys and Girls, and now, of course, the women's and the men's finalists. Uh, the, the winners going on their way, Yeti Jacobs and Michael Muir, off to Le Mans, France, to represent Australia. And that's all from Belcon and Bowl in Canberra for the 1992 AMF Coca-Cola South Pacific.